Watkins working Lindelof now. Checks back inside Watkins. Nicely done. Still carrying. Picks out Emmy Buendia. Leon Bailey running off his left shoulder. Leon Bailey could be in behind left foot and effort. Leon Bailey dancing to the reggae beat in front of the Holt end. Christening the Unai Emery era in minute seven. Well, that was something. I wanted to have a show out way sooner, but I got hit by the sick pretty good. I mean, it went from summer to winter here in like a week. I was driving home through a snowstorm yesterday. By the way, what do you think of this? I mean, is this not lovely? My Castor gear has finally arrived. I'm 6'2", 250. This is a 2XL. It's perfect. And I'm impressed. This material is really nice. The details are really cool. Black Friday is around the corner and deals are happening at the Fanatics Aston Villa online store. I've put a link in the description below if you want to do some you-know-what shopping in advance. You'll be helping out the show. And if you get on it, you'll have it in time for you-know-what. Do you know Leon Bailey has scored four goals for Aston Villa? All four of them have been in front of the Holt end under different managers. Dean Smith, Everton, Man City, Gerrard, Brentford with Aaron Danks, and now Unai Emery against Manchester United. Isn't that weird? And all three of Aston Villa's goals on Sunday had two really important things in common. We'll get into those as we recap Aston Villa 3, Manchester United 1. Here's the gift that best describes how I felt after Sunday despite being woefully ill. And Lee Hendry, the pundit on this broadcast, said this was a little early for showboating. Showboating? This is Emmy Martinez, a goalkeeper, not known for his first touch with the head. First touch was poor, and so that forced him to go backwards and touch it again. He's not showboating here. It was a back pass, and it wasn't a good first touch. Showboating. Really, Lee? Come on. What a sight that is, as we welcome you to the Holy Trinity Show, the three key issues or moments that defined Aston Villa 3, Manchester United 1, starting with the key statistics. I was surprised looking at these stats. I thought the game was a little bit more open from an attacking standpoint. Uh, I've keyed in on dirty moments as my stat of the day, but XG relatively low on both sides. Shots on target were down. Accurate passes good for both sides. One big chance each. Villa had less of the possession. Dirty moments. None by Villa. All by United. Mostly by Martinez and Ronaldo. None of which were punished, in my opinion. Now, I'm not sure that this match came down to three key or big issues, or whether it was the culmination of a lot of smaller details. Like, for example, the decision to ask the players to park their very expensive cars at Bodymore Heath and then hop on a coach and travel together to Villa Park. And that's when the team found out the starting 11, two and a half hours before kickoff. Both very interesting details. Or was this one really important and major issue. Now, as I've told you before, I love coaching youth football. I take it extremely seriously. And the one thing I've learned is that you are never, as a coach, the finished article, which is really frustrating. There is always more you could learn. So when a guy comes along with 900 plus games and success throughout that period of time, well, I'm I'm now fascinated and curious. And what was the first thing that Unai Emery said he was going to address in his opening press conference, and that was the building of confidence. Confidence, one of the key ingredients in a league that is so relentless, so ruthless, built of such fine margins where every single opponent is a potential landmine. The difference between mid-table to Europe and mid-table to relegation fight is collective and individual confidence. And in that game on Sunday, we saw so many examples of a Villa team that was poised under pressure, starting with Emmy Martinez being put under pressure, still getting the pass away beneath the shadow of his crossbar 
It was a bit tight, but there were several long passages of patient possession by Aston Villa. Players, many of whom have come under a lot of scrutiny this season, looked completely transformed over the course of one afternoon. And the word is confidence, one of the hardest things to find at times and one of the hardest things to keep. All three Villa goals had two things in common. And the first was a cohesive and effective press. Oh, the press. Do you remember the rumors, the fables, the enigma of this promised Villa press that was going to be part of its vaunted identity and yet it never materialized despite the fact it seemed as though we had built a squad around the concept of front pressing? Well, in this game, it did come off because on that first goal, good front pressure forced a panic ball into midfield. Douglas Luiz heads it backwards. And from there, a 16 pass move that wound up on the left foot of Leon Bailey into the bottom corner. It went on the second. Again, more front pressure forced a bad square ball. And Jacob Ramsey was just faster to react than Luke Shaw free kick to Bagel. And on the third goal, after two changes of possession, it was pressure by Emi Buendia to win the ball back and then quickly release Ollie Watkins. It's not just the press. It's identifying the transitional opportunity and then making that pass quickly. In fact, Emi Buendia's ball to Leon Bailey on his left shoulder was also urgent at the right time. So these are two things happening at the same time. Good front pressure and then decisive actions when you do create those changes of possession. And it worked to a charm. The other thing those three goals had in common, Ollie Watkins had a major hand in all of them. On the first, it was his front press that forced the bad ball into midfield that turned into a passing sequence which returned to him. He holds off Lindelof back to goal, which he was doing to everybody in that game. I and mean, he was always first to it back to goal. Shows him out, shows him in, plays the good ball to Buendia. Second one, again, he's putting pressure on. Bad square ball leads to the free kick. And the third one was his... Robocop-like best, where he is relentless, you can't get the ball off of him, he drives, and then the little ball, the split pass between defenders for Jacob Ramsey was just out of this world. A player who looked completely different than he did at other times this year. Confidence. How about Tyrone Mings? Could have been the man of the match for me. Didn't see many panicked clearances from Mings by foot. Yeah, there were some aerial clearances for sure, but those were necessary. He played three balls, I counted. Sharp along the deck, 10 to 15 yard passes, a couple of them to Watkins. Just a confident looking player. But then there was Douglas Louise, Jacob Ramsey, Leon Bailey, all of them. It was night and day. Villa were poised in possession. They were bright and they had this body language of front foot urgent football, get it forward. So how then does a manager just four days on the job and not fully fluent in English either, manage to put together such a cohesive game plan and instill that level of confidence in this group of players? Because this new manager bounce thing, you know, the best behavior bounce, I'd like to see the statistics on it from a wider range, like all Premier League sides, because I think it's more rare than you think that a manager wins that first game in charge. I mean, just look at Aston Villa's history. Winning your first ever game as a Villa manager is select company. And winning your first ever home game as a Villa manager, also very few have accomplished it. So it's not as automatic as we all think. But for Leon Bailey to have a go from that angle requires confidence. What about Luca Dean? We've been inept from the dead ball and those types of situations this year, and he's pinpoint perfect. That requires confidence. And it's not like Manchester United is a bunch of mugs, okay? It's not their best 11. And yeah, they've had a lot of matches in a short period of time, but that was not a bad side. And there's also this historical thing hanging over our heads always that we hadn't beaten United at home since 1995. We have to explore what it is that changed the players' mentality and gave them the confidence they needed on Sunday. Players are such interesting creatures. They never ever go out onto the park and intend to have a bad game. 
but so much of their confidence comes from the leadership. And in the case of Dean Smith, for example, here's a guy who was very successful in the championship, did a wonderful job with Brentford, was excellent in getting Villa out of the championship, surviving that first season, and then having a pretty decent COVID season as well. But the Premier League proved to be a little bit too ruthless for Dean Smith as the names got a little bit bigger and the challenges got a bit stronger. And when Jack Relish left, the whispers around the place were that the culture he had built had become too comfortable and that the inmates were kind of starting to run the asylum a little bit, which was ticking him off that he couldn't get them to perform anymore, along with potentially some internal issues between several players. And I'm wondering if two of those players that had issues were John McGinn and Tyrone Mings. And when you lose that confidence and when you start looking at your manager like you're a championship manager and you can't help us out of these troubles, everything changes. Enter Steven Gerrard, legendary ex-pro, demanding young manager, excitement and buzz around the hire, new manager bounce, yes, but someone who only had three years of experience in the Scottish Premiership and who deferred so much of the technical and tactical planning to his assistant. So you have to wonder when that assistant walked out the door, were the players convinced of the plan? Were the players believing in what was being presented to them. And not only that, did they believe in the man management style? And I think of all the things that did Steven Gerrard in, that's the one that let him down the most. I mean, we saw the freedom and the expression that occurred after that entire regime was swept out the door and how they played at home against Brentford, only to then have some similar themes recur when they went away to Newcastle. So along comes Unai Emery, a man with 900 plus games on his resume in addition to the silverware. If you're a player, how can you ignore that level of credibility? And is it possible that the Aston Villa players were crying out for more detail, more precise instruction in their game plan? And what they proved on Sunday for me is that they are capable of taking on more precise tactical information because of the way that they executed the press at the right times, the way they sat in when they needed to sit in and support one another defensively, but then also transitioned seamlessly to the 4-4-2 in the second half, which worked to perfection, 4-4-2. And especially on the 3-1 goal, you know, those two players up front were wide and they ended up all converging at the same time with Jacob Ramsey just burying it in the top corner. That brings us back around to the new manager, Unai Emery. How on earth did he manage to get so much out of that squad in such a short period of time? And the answer can only be his pedigree. You know, the players understand the CV here and the accomplishments. Even in-game, he made logical choices. How about John McGinn coming on and playing in a more advanced role like a lot of us armchair pundits have been crying out for? And then... Bubakar Kamara comes back already and is available for selection as an option. And hopefully, before too long, maybe before the season's over, one of Unai Emery's old players and Diego Carlos will be back in the fold as well. And when you put all those players together, you start to see on paper what we were kind of imagining as a squad with an awful lot of potential. And yet, this is one game in. And Emery made a huge point of saying, this is just one step. The goal is consistency and regularity, home and away. And in order for that to occur, it is going to take time and a lot of hard work. And now, once again, we're starting to hear that the owners are fully committed to backing Unai Emery in the January transfer window and beyond, much like we'd heard this time last year. And we're hearing rumors that Emery may be going after some of his former players at Villarreal, including Pino, Chukwueze, and Jackson. Although, that makes me a little bit nervous, that approach. Even though he did say it's not Villarreal players that I'm trying to poach, it's the players who made Villarreal a successful project that he's looking for, whatever that may mean. But now, upon reflection, when we look back at it, it's clear the owners had lost faith in Steven Gerrard long before those final weeks, which explains why it seemed like they put the brakes on 
near the tail end of the summer transfer window, even though Leander Dendonker looks like he's a very shrewd signing and the re-signing of Douglas Louise looks even better at this stage. I've said it a million times, it's way more fun to do this after a victory as Villa do pad some of the stats we've been following throughout the season, including the record at Villa Park, which improves to 13 out of 21 points. They have another set-piece goal for, thank you, Luca Dean, and four points out of a possible 15 against the top six. Their first win against the top six in, I don't even remember, to be honest with you. And now we do it all again, this time Thursday at Old Trafford for the Carabao Cup tie prior to the final league match before the World Cup break at Brighton. And neither of those two fixtures feel as daunting as they might have even a week and a half to two weeks ago. But I don't want to get carried away because Aston Villa fans are notorious for getting carried away. It's just that I've always felt this team was constructed to be a quick transition team. And on Sunday, they showed it. Press, win the ball, somebody's available, sharp 10 to 20 yard ball, decisive, urgent, not surveying, thinking, wondering, what am I going to do? Nah, let's get her done. You notice how the long, hopeful balls were limited on Sunday? How about the ball that Douglas Louise nearly played to Jacob Ramsey in the second half, only to have Man United's 12th man, Anthony Taylor, block the pass? Now, you know United will be sour about the way things played out on Sunday, and Eric Ten Hag was not happy with the performance at Villa Park. And if you're Unai Emery, cup time is Unai time, is it not? Does he go straight back to the well? I mean, you got Thursday, then you have Brighton on Sunday. There's a long World Cup break, only one World Cup campaigner in the squad, and that's your goalkeeper. Do you empty the tank and just go for it right now? Because you know United's probably going to have to rotate some players around. That's going to be very interesting to see how he approaches that team selection. I simply can't believe that VAR will allow Aston Villa to get through this round. I mean, they'll try to invent something. They'll be on the phone from Stockley Park. Was that offside? Oh, darn it. It wasn't offside. Was there a handball? No, there wasn't. Well, let's find something else. Wait three or four minutes until we find something and then we can knock them out. But still, I see opportunity here. And if he can triple down, why not? Honestly, I wanted to do a longer, more comprehensive show here for the magnitude of that win and the Unai Emery era kicking off in such style. But this time of year sucks. Daylight savings time is over. It's dark. It's damp. I mean, it's cold all of a sudden. And I don't feel very good, as you can probably tell and hear. So I'm going to rest up, prepare for these next two matches. And can you imagine if Villa could do United twice in the same week? I don't know about you, but I have an annoying amount of Manchester United glory hunters in my circle of work and personal friends. And oh, I need to be rested up so that I could do some proper chirping. Until then, be well, don't get sick, and as always, up the mighty Villa. Villa.